All right. Um, how is everybody doing today? My name is Mike Roberts. I'm a product engineer at Card.com. Uh, we are a online banking startup. You guys should check us out. We're pretty awesome. Um, today I'm going to talk about building mobile apps with uh, Ionic Framework and Cordova, which is essentially PhoneGap but forked, and Drupal. So we're going to be learning how to create an app like this guy here. Uh, fully functioning app. Hey, guys. OK, so what do we use to build it? Uh, Ionic Framework. As I said, it's a mobile development app. It's based on uh, Angular JS. It's pretty awesome and super easy to work with, so I highly suggest checking it out. Uh, we use Cordova, which allows HTML web apps to be uh, compiled to native apps and uploaded to app stores. And of course, we use Drupal because that's why we're here. Um, so you guys, you're gonna need to know a little stuff first before you get actually get started on any of this. Um, you're going to need to install Node.js and install Cordova and have a place to actually host your website, which would be the API that you're getting all your data from. And you should have a basic knowledge of JS and HTML as well, because I don't know how you would build it if you didn't. So uh, the main piece of our app is a Drupal backend, the easiest way to get started doing this is with the services module. And so what services does is it allows you to create um, like to, to create views and other types of content and um, serve that up as JSON. So I'll show you guys an example real quick. I've created a few views of attendees and sessions and a view of a schedule, um, which those end up looking like. So this is our attendees view, and this is our sessions view. They're not styled at all, so forgive me for that. But what they end up doing with through services is you get a whole bunch of JSON like this. which can be consumed by your app and pulled in to make things like this. Um, where did it go? All right. Oops. Um, so another way to do that is to use custom code, which is probably a lot more secure than actually using the services module, but that's for another presentation. Um, so since you guys are here at Drupal Camp, you probably know what hook menu is. You need a uh, you need a page for your API endpoint to point to and you need a function that returns JSON. And this is actually a super simplified version of this, but all you need to do is um, print out the, uh, the JSON that you, or encode the data that you pull from the database as JSON and then exit so Drupal doesn't render anything else. And that's about it. Now I move on to the app. The easiest way to get started is to after you install Ionic, you just use Ionic start, which is a command that they provide. And so in this example, we did we do Ionic start app name, which is whatever you want to call your app, and then side menu, which gives you the hamburger menu functionality that you guys saw earlier on. Um, and that actually gives us a full skeleton of an app. Um, I'll show you guys that now. So 
what that gives us is this entire folder here called Droopy app. Um, oh, I forgot to show you guys why it's actually called Droopy app. But so I made this website. It's called Droopy Camp LA. It's basically just a clone of the Drupal Camp website, sessions, attendees, etc. Um, anyways, so the main part of our app, there's three main files called app.js, controllers.js, and services.js, which if you have any experience with Angular, you will probably recognize what this is, but um, app.js basically is just how you um, configure all the different pages of your application. Um, a necessary part of each page is a controller which provides all of the functionality for that page. For instance, in our sessions page, we just, that's all it takes to grab the sessions from our Drupal site right there. And our services file is anything that needs to persist throughout the apps. Um, like if you have settings that get saved when a user takes an action, that would be in services and you just save it to local storage. Um, and then once you're all done adding all of your content to your app, um, you do Cordova build, which is what actually compiles it to the native code. Uh, which This takes a little while, but this actually makes an app that I can then install on my phone, which I will show you guys as well. Um, this is iTerm too, but yeah. Yeah, so I actually have the app on my phone now. Um, it, you guys won't be able to see this if you're watching it online, but we actually have all the parts of the app. It works. Yeah. Um, so now some tips and tricks to speed up development. If you notice, they're slanted because they're faster. Uh, one of my favorite things to use is Gulp. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Gulp and or Grunt, but they're just uh, front-end ops kind of programs that you can write JavaScript files to handle all sorts of different functionality for you. And for um, an app like this, this is uh, this is part of my Gulp file. I've had to shrink it down so there's not a whole lot of white space to make it look neat, but you guys can see everything that is needed for this. We have the um, SAS, which compiles all of our SAS files to CSS. We have our watch command, which uh, it compiles all of our SAS and reloads the browser. 
We have prepare, which moves everything to the iOS and Android folders, um, so you can prepare to build. And then Ionic serve, which actually sets up a local server and um, set and uses actually the watch and the library load as well, so that when you're building and you make changes to your files, every, uh, the app just reloads and every make a change. Um, tip number two is to develop and test in the browser because it is a hell of a lot faster than building every time you make a change, which you guys saw how long it took to build just for Android. Um, and an easy way to run a local server from your app is just to use Python. Um, this python-m simple HTTP server command just uses localhost port uh, 8000 and that you can just run your app right in the browser doing that. And tip number three, Cordova hooks. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Git, but Git also has hooks and this is kind of the same exact thing as that. Um, what you do is you have folders inside of your hooks for things like after you prepare, which is part of the build process, and all that a hook is, it's just a JavaScript file, and it's basically anything you can put in a grunt or gulp file that can be run anytime you run a command from Cordova. Um, the one I like the best is after prepare, because every time I build, it does things that I want it to do, such as, um, anyway. The thing that I use it for is I copy all of the icons from a resources folder to the actual platform folder so that it actually has all of the app icons in there, otherwise you have to put them in manually. And this allows it so that you don't have to track the platforms folder in Git because that's a pain and it changes every time you build and it changes depending on who's building it from which computer and like it's really terrible. Um, I'll show you guys a hook as well. So this is my after prepare hook. I don't know. Is that big enough for you guys to see? Or? It's essentially just it's it's actually just Node.js which runs it. Um, I'm copying this file to copy var is just providing all the files that I need to copy, and then we actually run it at the bottom. Right, so, question, it, uh, it just executes it, or is it giving us some context to some variables and the other hand, you know, what happened prior to it executing it, or is it just executing No, it just, it just executes, there's no, um, for the people online, Ben asked if, it, if you can provide any variables to it or anything like that for it to kind of be aware of itself, but um, it actually, it just runs whatever is in the file. There's no arguments or anything that you can add to it. Um, and number four, which took me a while to get used to since I was used to jQuery, is that Angular is based on dependency injection. So if you, are, if you want to use something inside of a controller or service, you need to make sure that it's available. like so. So this this ionic loading thing is something that they they give you which shows um, So that's what shows this loading pop up there when I'm waiting for the data to load. Um, you'll notice that I'm using it down here, or ionic loading show and ionic loading hide. But in order for me to actually use that and this HTTP command, I need to pass them into the controller before they are actually available. So, kind of like Drupal 8. And these are some useful links, like the INEC framework documentation, the Angular documentation, um, the awesome company that I work for, car.com. 
which allows me to come to Drupal camps and learn stuff and do talks. Um, link to my Twitter, but I don't tweet a whole lot, so you can follow me if you want. Um, I also provided source code for the app and the actual Drupal site that I built. Um, that was a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. So um, if you guys have questions or want any specifics, I'm more than happy to answer them. But Are these slides online right now? The slides? Um, they're on my GitHub. They're not. What's your GitHub? Uh, github.com slash Mike Roberts slash Mike dash Roberts. Sorry. Um, all right, let's have a little fun. Where's my terminal? All right, so I'm going to start a new app from scratch. Do you guys like tab layouts better or the hamburger menu better? Tabs, okay. <laughs> this just takes a little while to download stuff, but now that that's done. Hmm. I have no play into this again. You have no JS or something, right? Yeah, so Node is in the back end of this, and it actually is what most of the functionality comes from. Um, like the Ionic, all the Ionic commands, and the Cordova commands, that's all built on top of Node. So you actually need Node to install it. You, you do just do npm install Ionic or npm install. Um, Can you manage this to a home group? Uh, <laughs> um, it's not currently. I'm sure it could be, because it's, I mean, it's just an a Node.js command to install it, so I'm sure you could easily manage it through Homebrew, but installing it through Node is just as easy because you just npm install. Um, so that actually gave us, so the install is done, that actually gave us this uh, Ionic folder. The main folder you want is the www folder, that's where all of the, the web app is, and if we do Python command I showed you earlier. We now have a web app or mobile app. Is that addressed for your node server? Hmm? Okay. No, that was, I just did the, that Python command I showed you guys earlier, the python m sql oh. HTTP server. Oh. That's probably the quickest way to get it up and running, but. Like, I didn't kind of call it, when you specify tabs, is that like a template? Or that's just defining uh, the menu structure? Yeah, so. So this ionic start command is, it just builds a skeleton of an app for you, and you can specify either um, blank if you want, just a blank template to start with, or you can specify tabs or side menu, which provides the basis for your navigation for the app. So that's this command also creates the Yep. Yeah, so if, if you want to build a simple app, it's... Um, Super easy to just replace the content on the pages that they already give you. And to add new pages, you would go into the app.js folder. Which has all the pages listed here, the, uh, the home, home page, the friends page, the account page. 
if we want to add a tab. So um, Anik has this thing called navigation stacks. Uh, and if you'll notice here, it says um, tab, which is the the main state. It's based on um, Angular UI router has these things called states, which is how you navigate throughout the app. And um, different states can have different navigation stacks, but the first state is tab, and then afterwards, if you want to add things to your tabs, you have to do tab dot whatever your next page is going to be. So if we wanted to add a page to the tab, we do tab cam. The views part is important because that's um, that controls uh, which tab it falls under for your navigation stack. So tab. Is URL your endpoint? Wait. Yeah. So. And you say you can define that in services. Module. No, service uh, services JS is for. That's where you would define all of your like API endpoints for your actual backend to call to them. Um, okay, so to add a state, you have to specify the state, the actual name of the state, the URL where you want it to um, to be, the view, the template, and the controller. So now that we specified the state, we need to add template, which we named tab cam. And now, if we refresh, oops, forgot about that. There's this actual tabs file that specifies all of the tabs. I'll just give you guys an overview of what Ionic actually offers. Um, so they have a lot of stuff available just through CSS classes on top of the actual directives that they give you, which are the custom HTML elements. Um, this VGA is not big enough for you guys to see everything. There's all sorts of stuff. There's buttons header, footer, um, lists, icons, these things are actually pretty cool. Um, they have 
a bunch of form styling, and they have floating labels, which are a pretty big thing on mobile now. So once you start typing, the label show up at the top. They have these toggles, which are nice. So, actually, I'm going to show you guys some really cool stuff. Um, so part of Angular is they have this thing called um, ng class, which is actually how I did all of these the different icons on the side of the sessions here. And so the way that looks is you Angular has a lot of things that are prefixed with ng like this, like ng class, um, ng repeat, ng show, but this is basically just um, Angular saying you can define a JavaScript ex expression inside of this um, HTML attribute. So for this ng class attribute here, I specified a bunch of stuff like this, you know, droop code. It's if session session category, which is part of the stuff that I'm pulling into this. Um, if it finds backend in the string of session category, then it gives it the droop code class, which gives it this code logo here. Um, and you can specify all sorts of different stuff. So I have um, probably 10 different classes inside of this ng class attribute that get applied depending on if there are certain strings of text inside of a uh, session category. So that's one of the cool powers of Angular. This ng repeat is also an Angular directive, which if you have an array or an array of object or an object with a bunch of objects inside of it, it can do, it just does a giant for each loop inside of that and pulls them all out in a list like this. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, how did you tie Guzzle or Gulp in again? So. Gulp. Um, so Gulp is it's just a Gulp file in my root directory. And this just has a bunch of stuff that I can run from the command line. Uh, I'll show you. Like, oops, that's wrong. So Gulp serve is what I use to actually do a server for this app, but um, have you used Gulp or Grunt before, Steve? A little bit. A little bit. Um, yeah. So it's it's not just for app development; it's just for front end development in general. But um, what it is, it's just a bunch of JavaScript code that lets you chain a bunch of different tasks together. Um, so you define, these are a bunch of uh, node modules, gulp, gulp utility, you know, gulp sass, which compiles my sass, gulp minify CSS, which minifies everything and renames it and puts it where it needs to be. Um, and you can do all sorts of different things with this, like, uh, where is it here? This sh exec actually just runs a command in terminal. So if I want to run gulp, build iOS, it just runs Cordova build iOS. Or if I run if I run build all, it runs both build Android and iOS. So I don't have to keep typing Cordova build Android, Cordova build iOS, all that sort of stuff. Um, this gulp serve task which I use actually has prepare which moves all of the moves all the web files and the icons and everything to the platforms directory where uh, the Android and the iOS folder and sets everything up how you need it to be for it to be built. And then Ionic Serve just serves from, it just serves up the app that you just prepared and sets up live reload and everything like that. Are you 
Um, well, it's a completely separate app. It's not really related to Drupal. I'm just using, yeah, I'm just using... I have Drupal as a backend, yeah, but... Um, so, that's how I... Uh, I'll show you guys real quick. Yeah, I'm using Angular's HTTP service. I'll show you guys that real quick. So this right here, HTTP. It's just a get request to whatever URL you provide it. Um, that's the backend for the site that I showed you guys, the Drupalcamp site that just returns a bunch of JSON. Of this. In this case, it's the sessions. In this case down here, it's the attendees. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so I use the services module to do that, but you can also, um, you can also write custom code that just prints JSON and doesn't render anything from Drupal. So, both of those methods are actually pretty easy, but services is way easier because you don't, well, you don't have to write any code for services. You can just build a view, or you know, I think you can do entities and nodes as well. Any any entity, any any uh, node, any user, any piece of content on your Drupal site, um, most likely services can find it and print it out as JSON. So. Um, you guys, have any questions or want more details? Um, yeah, so they just use Angular testing framework, which I believe is called, I believe it's Protractor. Um, it, yeah, Ionic isn't really, um, it's not any sort of like different like platform or anything. It's just, it's just a bunch of Angular directives and um, Right, yeah. It's just, it's just straight up, it's just straight Angular and um, they use, Angular uses Protractor for testing, yeah. So you can write Protractor tests for your Ionic app as well. Um, well, Bootstrap for Angular is pretty terrible because it's really not performant on mobile. Um, Ionic is built only for mobile. It's not built for like websites or anything like that. So um, it's everything is based on getting the most performance they can out of your mobile phone in a web app. So like I have a crappy old Android two three device and Bootstrap functions terribly on it, but Ionic actually kind of works. So. Um, Ionic is pretty much all about performance on your mobile phone. Um, Can you show setting up an endpoint in Drupal? Like, um, yeah, I can do that Yeah. Um, set up a new one. This, this took me a little while to figure out because I've never actually used services before. But why well, didn't you? So, um, I think that yeah, that's just the default. You can add other types of servers as well, but that one's just the default. Um, so you have to specify a path to the endpoint. So it's going, it's going to be whatever URL is slash API, and I added v2 because I already have API. Um, you can set up authentication so people can lock in with their username and password or they need 
a session ID already, where you can set everything to be available to anonymous users, whichever. Um, so this resources part is actually what gets everything into um, service. So if I want to show, you know, users, I want to retrieve the user, or I want to show a list of all users. If I make that user. So I added um, I added two endpoints to our API of charger user and view. I specified that in the alias there. So now if we go to API v2 view and then you have to type in a view machine. So views is one of my views. I'm not sure what it did. Um, here, I'll show you the whole thing because that one actually works. But. So I just specified API is the path to the endpoint. I, s I set up the server here to um, show what type of content, uh, what type of content we accept, like. We accept application JSON, form URL encoded, and multi-part form data, and you can return JSON or JSON P. The JSON P doesn't actually work. So, and then in here, you can see I added, um, I added nodes so I can retrieve a node with the alias of n. Um, I added users with the alias of u, and I can retrieve a user or which is an index of all the users, and use with v, so I can retrieve the view. And that works. If I type API slash view, So that's my my sessions view, and this is my attendees view. Did you notice it come back as JSON? Uh, that's just the checkbox that I checked. Okay. But you also have JSON P there. Yeah, but JSON P you have to do all sorts of different extra stuff. Like you have to specify a callback, which is. A lot more difficult to get into, but <laughs> like if I uncheck this, it'll still work because it's just serving with JSON. But then, what are those boxes below? So yeah, these are these are the headers that it accepts when you make a request to it. So um, that's handled all by the HTTP in Angular. Um, they use application JSON because you can get requests. But um, if you're making your own XHTML request or XML request in JavaScript, you would need to specify which header you're making the call with. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so when you set up your when you set up your view resource or your node resource, you need for node you need the NID you just specified in the URL. So I have it's API slash n for nodes, and then if I wanted to load, load node twenty five, I just do API n slash twenty five, and that would load the node. Or view. And for view, yeah, you put the uh, machine name. So like I had attendees and sessions. And it's just slash v slash attendees, which is the view or the machine. Block. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried it with a block view yet. That's, that's a good question. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to see? Ben says yes. Yeah. Um, I think the the integration with the other allows you to look at the other thing. You just set it in your current client to offer whatever you want. Yeah, I can go with the current file with me. Right. Yeah. So yeah, all Cordo does is just it takes your web app that you built, it just moves it to a different folder, and then wraps it in a native web view, and you build your app around that. So um, it's the exact same files that you built. It um, Cordo just moves everything into place, and yeah. <laughs> It's just it's just it's just a just a native web view wrapper around your web app, and you can get into uh, native plugins as well. Cordova has plugins like um, I used a native maps plugin on one of our apps. Um, a lot of times, it's pretty hard to control a lot of the native plugins from your web app because they the plugins are usually only written with a couple functions that you know. Open your camera, take a picture, etc. But like you don't have access to the rest of the native code that actually makes the camera function and stuff like that. So um, it can be a pain to actually use the native plugins, but some of them actually work pretty well. Um, so, yeah, so Cordova, Cordova is actually just, or not Cordova, um, Ionic is actually just a, um, just an Angular app, essentially. And to use the HTTP Angular is built on dependency injection, so you actually have to actually specify HTTP wherever you want to use it, and then use it. So, um, right, because it's just it's just JavaScript making the web request. Yeah, Cordova doesn't really know anything about your app. It just is like there's a web view. Whatever's inside of it is inside of it. There's definitely there's definitely disadvantages to this over native apps because. You know, you can't do everything that you can with a native app, but for the most part, I think 90% of apps will be able to be built with this and be just fine. So. Uh, yeah, yep, yeah. We have, I actually use mobile storage quite a bit with our app, but.
Um, so my main problem was getting used to Angular because I came from, obviously in Drupal everything is jQuery. So I came from a jQuery world which is completely upside down of Angular. With Angular you don't manipulate the DOM at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's like in jQuery everything's about manipulating the DOM to kind of get what you want. And then with Angular you just specify where stuff should be inside of the DOM and then you manipulate the actual data itself and Angular handles that for you. So it's, it's kind of like a weird way to wrap your head around stuff. And also getting used to dependency injection in Angular was another weird thing for me. I'd be like, why can't I use this? It's part of you know, the JavaScript window scope. Why can't I use it? And I'm like, no, well, because you need to pass it in through the function. And, I don't know. It was, it was just kind of weird to get used to. Once you get used to it, it's so much easier than jQuery ever was. But. <laughs> Make a slideshow with reveal.js. Do you have like a little app in it? <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite part. This one? It's just, just, a, it's just an iframe with a, a iPhone image as a background. I guess that's it if you guys don't have any more questions or want to see something else.